So uh, I'm going to start out just by um, first defining clinical informatics. I realize that there's some uh, variation in, uh, in, in flavors in informatics, and also talk about some of the, the roles of EHR and clinical decision support plays with precision medicine. So um, we'll see. Uh, so I'll also talk about uh, technology and information gaps impacting precision medicine and some of the clinical informatics approaches to address uh, gaps. And so uh, much of what Sandy said uh, will probably be uh, described here in, in, in some detail as well, which kind of validates some of these gaps that have been identified. So just briefly, bioinformatics can be thought of some, as, a, as a science in some extent, to some extent where uh, where the domains are really driving the areas of research and then biomedical informatics methods and techniques and, uh, are, are common across those domains. And so uh, since this is related to clinical informatics, we're really thinking about uh, the actual clinical care activities like medicine, pharmacy, ner nursing, dentistry, et cetera, and they're all patient-oriented. Uh, this is just a brief def definition from Amia. Uh, and, and to further define clinical care activities related to precision medicine, precision medicine, um, I like to use the term P4 medicine that, that's coined by Leroy Hood at, at the Institute of Systems Biology, mm -hmm. which is predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. And this is, these areas are very well represented in, in IGNITE. Uh, for example, predictive in terms of family history uh, of risk and susceptibility, um, being able to uh, prevent adverse drug events with pharmacogenomics knowledge, uh, complex disease and ri uh, risk advice, which integrates both uh, clinical data and genomic data. And then it's participatory. Uh, there are participatory examples where, self, where patients want to self-manage uh, complex diseases. And so decision support is the bridge between um, is the bridge to overcome many of the barriers to realizing precision medicine. And this is kind of the starting point for IGNITE. And uh, so this was from a paper in 2012, which, uh, just out, which outlined some of the barriers to realizing precision medicine as limited genetic proficiency of, cl of clinicians, limited availability of genetic experts, and, gross, and the growing genetic knowledge that need to be managed. And so, uh, and so, we're able to, uh, so we're, we're able to use clinical decision support to really make the information that's been discovered available at the point of care. And so I like this uh, figure to really show how uh, clinical decision support can facilitate precision medicine. Uh, first, it outlines what is the typical workflow um, when a patient comes into the office and then they need to wait in the waiting room and until a nurse or, or a medical assistant sees them, a physician then sees the patient, and then a, a final treatment decision is made based upon all of the data that's available to them. And what's shown in this figure also is that there are several uh, paths that could be supported by clinical decision support. Uh, so importantly, there's a lot of data and, not, and, and information sources that, are, that could be accessed for, for clinical decision support. So we see the, dot, the dashed lines going from the first two boxes are, are uh, data collected from a patient that are being stored within the electronic health record. And then also, uh, once a physician is seeing a patient, they may order a laboratory test, which is then um, interacting with another clinical system. So some of the areas where we're beginning to see our other data, our, our other data repositories for clinical trials data, um, molecular databases, biomarker repositories. Um, we talked about uh, passive decision support earlier where that might be access to um, journal articles, um, also information from other patients that are at other EHRs. As, Within the IGNITE network, there's several, there are several institutions who are working together, and we may be able to use population data from multiple EHRs at some point for risk algorithms, for example. And so uh, on, the other, on the, um, the other side of this figure, it just shows that there are several uh, points of delivery within the workflow of, uh, of a patient visit in this case. 
Um, so we see that screening, or if the if the uh, if the um, genetic test results are already available for a patient, it may be filtering test results for different scenarios, and those could be presented uh, at the at the time when a patient comes to the office, for example. Um, also assisting with a, assisting in uh, visit acuity, uh, also suggesting possible differential diagnoses, and suggesting up-to-date treatment protocols. So these are all areas uh, that could be facilitated by clinical decision support. And so now um, thinking about what are some of the technology and information gaps for implementing precision medicine, uh, I broke it down into those, those three main areas uh, so the healthcare delivery process, thinking about the workflow. Uh, for each of the projects within Ignite, there are different types of workflows that are, are relevant and may not be. Um, and, so those, and so the different transactions for interacting with the EHR may inform how decision support is made available and what the, what the timing is and what uh, data resources are available. Also, there are multiple stakeholders. We've talked about patients, healthcare providers, lab professionals, bioinformaticists, and health IT professionals, uh, so, and, and also pharmacists. So there are several stakeholders who may be involved at different, uh, uh, depending on the domain and also uh, at what point the patient's being cared for. Uh, in terms of the data and information sources for clinical decision support, there are various sources that are, that are uh, relevant, and so uh, we've already talked about lab data ver versus EHR data, and so we need to be able to assess those, the, those data together. Um, their data storage and access and exchange requirements uh, to be able to um, integrate and access them in a, in a private and secure way. Also ensuring high quality and being able to identify actionable data. Uh, we talked about, or we heard earlier about uh, variants of unknown significance, and, and Sandy discussed the option of uh, reinterpreting variants over time, and so we need to have processes uh, for identifying when that actionability changes. And so that, that brings me to uh, the last area of delivery of decision support. So how we deliver those uh, data may, may vary depending on um, the environment and also the actionability of, of what's being delivered. Um, so, and and uh, there's dependence on vendor-specified capabilities. Uh, so Across the network, there are, are, are several EHRs that are represented. And even if you have the same vendor, like Epic, uh, there's different flavors of Epic. And so being able to uh, take that into consideration when we're trying to come up with generalizable uh, implementation approaches is important. Also, uh, current clinical decision support is, uh, are inadequate. And part of that is uh, because uh, the kinds of data that we're, we're dealing with where it needs to be reinterpreted over time. And, and, and again, Sandy brought up some, some unique aspects of uh, the projects that, that he's involved in where there, are, there is infrastructure for that kind of reinterpretation. But in general, a lot of the, a, a lot of the approaches um, have, have been uh, implemented for, for different types of scenarios. And so when I talk with physicians sometimes, I, I hear that you know, they've gone through their whole process and then they get an alert message that says what they've, what they've uh, ordered, what they've put on um, order for their patient has, uh, uh, has, has, is incorrect. And so then they have to start all over again. And so being able to, to uh, intervene earlier in that process, for example, would be useful for some types of, um, for, for some types of data. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how, like, there, how there could be some approaches in clinical, in clinical informatics to help ad address some of these issues. And um, it's kind of a cross between informatics and implementation science within this group. And so, uh, so some of the lines are, are blurred there. But uh, a key, a key uh, process in, in informatics is, is doing a needs assessment. And so first understanding the, how, how the, the workflow and the context uh, is, is shaped to inform how your, your decision support will be implemented is important. So we want to know like, what, are the work, what are the pre EHR, EHR, and post EHR tasks? Who are the stakeholders? And, and what and how are that data used? Um, in addition, uh, we could think about the workflow of, of uh, implementing decision support rules as well, where we're, we're starting with uh, most, most institutions have a rule authoring environment and they're developing a rule. 
uh, that uh, generates alert, an alert based upon a clinical event and the, fit, the patient data that's available. And once that fires, then there's offered choices that, are then, that then need to be responded to. And before you go through this process, there are um, approaches to monitor that implementation. And so that's one of the things that, we could, uh, that could probably be pursued within the Ignite network in terms of uh, before actually um, implementing the decision support, seeing how many times it's going to fire and whether uh, it's firing more often than you really need it to fire. Also, um, after it's been implemented, if there are ways to monitor the screens of folks who are using the, the decision support to see if they're responding how you would expect them to, you can also capture different types of, um, of uh, process measures, such as uh, whether they're ignoring it, whether they spend a second to two seconds on the alert, and so you can learn from those kinds of processes. Next, thinking about the data information sources, uh, we know that, uh, again, needs assessment is important. And so are there needs and uh, there are there needs for data that aren't cap currently captured? Are they being captured as free text uh, versus as something more structured that can trigger an alert message? Um, so we need to understand what our data looks like and whether we, whether we have what we need. Also, using standardized terminology for d and data exchange standards are important when, we talk, when we're talking about integrating those data. Um, integrated knowledge environments that can bring those data together could be uh, one area. And then being able to share uh, interpretations uh, that are authoritative, concise, and informative uh, are important. And, and some of those things we're, we're seeing more of. So the last point is um, on delivery of decision support. Um, being able to characterize CDS capabilities, we can draw from a lot of the work that's already been done with clinical decision support and being able to characterize um, what those capabilities are. Can they support alert messages? Can they support passive and, and active decision support? Um, what, uh, a recent review article showed that most EHRs lack some K CDS capabilities that are required, um, but, uh, uh, but um, it's still, so, but even though they lack those things, there's a potential to use other modalities for, for decision support. Um, also, understanding readiness, readiness to adopt CDS, user experience and design considerations are important, and being able to measure uh, implementation over time, uh, which uh, can represent adoption as well as uh, downstream outcomes. And this is just some of the outcomes that could potentially be considered. And so this is just summarizing uh, those, three, those three main areas and some of the potential ways to address those challenges. So, thank you. Thank you, Casey. Next, we have Josh Peterson presenting on behalf of the Ignite Network.